we've probably all heard the term confidence man, confidence woman. We shorten it to con man, con woman. And that's somebody who attempts to defraud a person or a group by first gaining their confidence and trust. They're going to find some way to learn something about you that they can use against you. So they'll count on someone who's naive or, or ignorant or maybe overly compassionate or, or vain or irresponsible or greedy, and they'll prey on their weakness in some way to deceive them, to get something from them. Some of you remember that several years ago I was pulling into a gas station in San Inez, pulling up to get my gas. Just as I'm getting ready to get out of the car, I get a phone call. It's got kind of a strange phone number, but I answer it. Immediately, I hear heart-wrenching screams of a woman. It sounds like her limbs are being torn off. And over that, I hear a very loud male voice saying, I've got your mother, and I'm going to kill her. And if you don't give me money, I'm going to kill her. And that screaming is going on in the background. Now, that morning, my mother, who lives with us, had gone to Bakersfield. She was going to go visit some friends. So I knew she wasn't home. And I'm hearing this screaming, and I'm saying, who is this? Who is this? I'm going to kill her. I'm going to kill her. And the screaming, blood-curdling screaming. And I'm going back and forth. What am I supposed to do? And I'm not sure what to do. And I don't know what I would have done had my mother not actually pulled up behind me in the garage, in the gas station, right behind me. I'm looking in my rearview mirror. I'm hearing the screaming. My heart is palpitating. I don't know what I'm going to do until I look in the rearview mirror and I see my mother. That's what we call an epiphany. <laughs> I said, wait a minute. And then all of a sudden, it became clear to me I was being conned. Somehow, somebody had figured out that my mother was not going to be home. And they knew that to use that against me. Had it not been for her pulling up behind me, that divine appointment, I probably would have been trying to figure out how to give money. Being conned. In that few seconds, they had me believing them. In life, there are people, political parties, organizations, ideas that want us to place our confidence in them. They assure us that if we do, all will be good. But guys... Where you place your confidence is critical. Who and what you place your confidence in is critical, absolutely critical. This morning in our passage, Paul is going to be talking about how he had, for his entire life, put his confidence in this thing and realized only at the end he'd been conned. He put his confidence in the wrong thing. And then he's going to show us how to win at the confidence game by placing our confidence where it should be. And that's what our whole passage is about this morning. That's what Paul's going to be talking about. Do you want to know what you should put your confidence in? Okay. <laughs> it's going to be a short sermon. <laughs> We're going to see this morning that Paul says there are three things. Three things we need to keep in mind if we're going to win at the confidence game. And the first thing is simply avoiding the cons. Avoiding the cons. You know, the one thing that every successful confidence game results in is a feeling of despair. And you've been taken. You've been lied to. And just that empty feeling of being conned. And a confidence game properly played out steals your joy. Big time. And... Paul knew something about that. That's why he says in verse 1, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same thing again is no trouble to me, and it's a safeguard for you. Beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of the false circumcision. For we are the true circumcision, who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in in the flesh. Now Paul starts this section with rejoice in the Lord, which is the theme of the letter. Rejoice in the Lord. And then right after he writes these words, he begins, he begins explaining what you're going to be tempted to do, which is to rejoice in something else. 
And he's going to explain what that is in a moment. Rejoicing in your lineage, rejoicing in your ancestry, rejoicing in your privileged position, rejoicing in your best religious efforts. It's why Paul begins with rejoice in the Lord. Not in those other things. In the Lord. Find your joy in the right place. You're not going to find it in your cultural identity. You're not going to find it even in your religious identity. How many people grow up in church? They get some nominal Christian background or introduction or teaching. And and while they often leave that behind, in the back of their minds, they can still believe that that exposure kind of gives them an in with God. I was born into the right team. And so no matter what I do, I'm still kind of on the team because I was born into the team. They were born into the right belief system, so they feel safe eternally, which is why if you ask so many nominal Christians or even just people on the street, if you were to die today, do you think you would go to heaven? 90 plus percent say yes. But their faith is not in Jesus. Their faith is not in the gospel. It's in their cultural or religious heritage. Their parents went to church and believed, and they attended Sunday school as a child, And essentially, that's where Paul was. That was Paul's background. He was in because of where he had been born and his national privilege before God. So he repeats the importance of rejoicing, not in those things, but in the Lord. Why does he say? He says it's a safeguard for you. you got to know what to rejoice in. It's a safeguard. So Paul knows where the joy is, but he also knows where the joy stealers are. So you can know where the joy is, it's in the Lord, but do you know where the stealers are? The things that will steal your joy. Friends, there is no good gift that God wants to give you that Satan doesn't try and steal from you. Okay? Every day. Every day. So Paul says three times, beware. Beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of the false circumcision. Now, culturally, when we hear something like, beware of the dogs, we think of Naya, or Fufu, or Fido, or Bailey, or, or so, we think of our little pet that we love so much. Guys, people back then didn't really have dogs as pets, okay? They were kind of roaming, feral packs. They were scavengers. They were dangerous. They were flea-ridden Dangerous things that would kill stock, would kill animals, could could even kill people. So it was a bad thing. Whatever he's likening this to, it's not a good thing. Beware of the dogs. Then he goes on and says, beware of the evil workers. Now later we're going to find out that these are the people who claim to be the party of the good works. But Paul is simply warning here that their message is straight from the pit of hell. Guys, Satan doesn't care what you believe. He really doesn't care what you believe as long as you don't believe in Jesus. Okay? So that's the thing that he's going to be moving you constantly away from. Don't trust in Jesus. Whatever you do, don't trust in Jesus. They are the false circumcision. He says, beware of the false circumcision. You know, it's interesting. Paul uses a pun here. The word translated circumcision here literally means a mutilation. A mutilation. Beware of the party of the mutilation, the people that want to make you mutilate yourself. Now, we've, we learned about this in Galatians. If you remember, we were in Galatians. Um, certain uh, Jewish Christians were going around to all the churches telling Gentile believers who had become Christians as Gentiles, you know, you're not quite a Christian. To be a real Christian, you've got to become Jewish. So all you men, you need to be circumcised. You need to get back underneath the law. You need to obey all the commandments. You need to do all the ceremonial things in the temple. That's the only way you're a real Christian. And uh, and you need to be circumcised. But the New Testament teaches that Christians have a, a spiritual circumcision, that God does something special on our heart that sets us apart. You take 10 Christians, you put them in a crowd, you're not gonna pick them out. They're gonna look like everybody else. What's going to be different is how they act. What's going to be different is their heart. That's what's been changed. It's not a surgery. We don't need physical circumcision anymore because we're not identifying with an ethnic race. We're identifying with Jesus. 
and the kingdom of God. So what is Paul saying? Paul is saying here that circumcision, baptism, the Lord's Supper, tithing, none of those things can rescue you from your sins. None of them. Only faith in Jesus can do that. And that's why Paul continues and says, For we are the true circumcision, who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. The sign of true Christianity isn't a surgery that's done on our bodies. It's people who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and don't put any confidence in the flesh. Satan is playing a con game. He wants you to put your faith in anything but Jesus. And so he'll bring all kinds of things in your life to do that. It can be comfort, security, money, a job, relationships. It can be all kinds of things. Trust those. Trust those. Just don't trust Jesus. He wants us to worship ourselves or other gods and glory in ourselves and what we've accomplished. But if you've been a Christian for any period of time and you're self-honest, you realize we've got nothing to boast about. Amen? We've got nothing to boast about. We're just people. As Paul told the Ephesian Christians, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it's the gift of God, not as a result of works. So no one can boast. No one will ever stand foot to foot, face to face with Jesus and tell them how great a guy, how great a person they were. And that's why they should get into heaven. You know, I may think that I'm a pretty good basketball player in my local senior citizen league, you know, out there with my crutch and my walker, you know, I'm playing basketball. Until LeBron James or Stephen Curry comes, and I look like an idiot because he's really good. I just think I'm good. So we have no confidence in our flesh. God doesn't compare us with one another. He compares us with Jesus. That's why we fail. It's because we're not perfect. Robert Ringer wrote a book called Looking Out for One. And he writes this, and I thought this was poignant. In my early 20s, I was introduced to Harold Hart, whose Wall Street investing had made him a millionaire. One evening, I visited Mr. Hart to do a deal. When I arrived, I found him resting in his favorite chair with servants waiting on him hand and foot. I sat there waiting as he stared blankly into space. Finally, he muttered, You know, nature's played a great hoax on man. You work all your life, go through an endless number of struggles, play all the petty little games, and if you're lucky, you finally make it to the top. Well, I made it to the top a long time ago, and you know what? It doesn't mean a blank thing. Nature's made a fool of man, and the biggest fool of all is me. Here I sit in poor health, exhausted from years of playing the game, well aware that time is running out, and I keep asking myself, now what, genius? What's your next brilliant move going to be? All that time I spent worrying, maneuvering, it was meaningless. Life's nothing but a big hoax. We think we're so important. The truth is we're nothing. Nature hadn't played a hoax on heart. Satan had. Satan had conned him. Conned him into putting his confidence in the wrong thing. And only at the very end did he realize, wow, this is where that gets me. So as we've seen, winning at the confidence games involves, first of all, avoiding the cons. Your resume before God is worthless. Don't count on it. Jesus' resume before God is perfect. And he gives it to you. Count on that. But next we're going to see that winning the confidence game involves laying all your cards on the table. Now, Paul kind of stops here in this passage and, and kind of says, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Let me show you the kinds of things that you can be putting your confidence in that are bad, that are a waste of your time. So he writes, verse 4, Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. Circumcise the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. He just shared with you his spiritual resume. 
He just shared with you, this is what I presented to God all my life. This was going to be why one day God would let me into heaven. This. Dr. Warren Wiersbe writes, Like most religious people today, Paul had enough morality to keep him out of trouble, but not enough righteousness to get him into heaven. You know what's really ironic? It wasn't the bad things that Paul had to give up that kept him away from God. It was the good things. Most people think that to come to God, I have to give up the bad things that I do. So if I'm involved in carousing or drinking or sleeping around or abusing people, whatever it is, I've got to give those things up. And that's going to be the hardest thing for me to become a Christian is giving those bad things up. No, it's not. You can give those things up because most of the time we realize we shouldn't be doing those anyway. At least we've got some confidence that, yeah, that's probably not a good thing to do. So it's, it's kind of easier to do that. But Paul points out that it's the good things that are the hardest to give up. Those things you're proud of. Those things that you place your confidence in. Those things you put on your wall. Your degrees, your your resumes. Those things that people praise you for. Those things you're gifted at. Those are the hard things to give up. The hardest thing to give up, Paul says, are those good things you're putting your confidence in to give you peace with God and eternal life. See, Paul knew all about trusting cultural markers and identity markers. As a young student, he had sat at the feet of Gamaliel, who was a great rabbi, the greatest rabbi of the day. And Paul was like his A student. He had a very promising career as a religious leader. He was the top of the class. And as Paul cites his resume here, he calls this his confidence in the flesh. This is where all my confidence was before God. You know, often when we hear, as Christians, people, uh, the scriptures use the word flesh, we think that it only refers to, to our sinful nature, the bad things that we do. But in this context, Paul means slightly di- something slightly different by it. Context determines the usage of this word. He was talking about the pride of spiritual lineage. He's talking about the, their ancestry, his, his history with God, their being the chosen people. And if anybody could lay claim to having that, Paul could. He was circumcised according to the law, which means that when he was born and they circumcised him, he entered into the covenant with God. Do you remember the covenant in Exodus? That's how you got there. You entered that covenant with that circumcision. So he had done that. He had had it done to him. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. Why does he bring that up? When Absalom, David's son, rebelled against him, he took ten tribes with him. Only one tribe stayed with Judah. Which one was it? Benjamin. It's an important tribe, faithful tribe. He was a passionate Jew, loving and being devoted to the law of God, so much that he became a Pharisee, a religious ruler, a religious teacher. And no one could make a claim that Paul wasn't a man of complete integrity and morality. In fact, he was so zealous for the law that he was out trying to stop this Christian cult, this Jesus cult that was ruining Judaism. That, that's, that's what his, his resume was. That's what the joy stealers, the party of the circumcision, were counting on, the very thing Paul said he already had. They had turned the gospel upside down. Remember in Galatians, we we learned about these people who came in and and said, you've got to go back to the law. What Jesus did, he didn't really rescue you. It was just a divine assist. So Jesus kind of gave you a a leg up. The rest is up to you. You've got to get under the law. So all of a sudden, you move from grace to works. And you find you really haven't budged from where you were before. The problem was full-blown in the church in Galatia. It really hadn't reared its head here in Philippians, but Paul knew it was coming. These people would go to every church, and he knew at some point these people were going to show up at the church in Philippi and say, okay, we know you guys think you're spiritual. We know you guys think you know Jesus, but let, me, let us show you how to really get, get home. So Paul laid his cards on the table. This is what I had. This is what these people are going to tell you you need. I had all of it and more. All of it. This was what my confidence was in. This was a sterling resume to offer to God if that's what God required. And each one of us has something much like this. We've got our own resume that we offer to God. 
Maybe we claim that we've been more good than bad. I hope you have. Maybe we're nice people. I hope you are. And surely being nice is good enough for God. Maybe we're spiritual people. Maybe we're religious people. Surely that's got to be enough, right? But it's not. So after laying all his cards on the table, Paul is now going to show that winning at the confidence game involves finally discovering the great profit in loss. Discovering the great profit in loss. You see, the only way you can win at the confidence game to keep from being conned is to be sure that your confidence is in the right person, in the right thing. That's the only way to win. That's why Paul writes here one of the most powerful statements in the entire Bible. These are four verses that if you don't memorize anything else ever, I'd suggest you memorize these. These four verses. What does he say? But whatever things were gained to me, He's talking about those things he's just listed. All those cultural markers, all those good things he's done. Whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Whatever things, Paul shouts out, whatever things, my Jewish circumcision, my national heritage, my tribal heritage, my religious party heritage, my resume as an absolute zealot for the law of God, my sterling moral resume, all these things I count as loss. Trash. I write them off as useless. Now, you have to understand something. None of those things were bad. Okay? None of those things were bad in and of themselves. They were good things. There's nothing wrong with them. Any more than being good and kind and moral are bad things in and of themselves. Those are good things. Or being an American is a bad thing. Or being a Democrat or Republican is a bad thing. Or being a truly caring human being is a bad thing. He's making a comparison. He's comparing one thing with another. He's comparing all those things, everything, in one list, with only one thing in the other list knowing Christ. It says, I take all my resume and I got Christ over here and he's better. I take everything else in my life and what I have here is better than everything that's in the other list. Everything is about knowing Christ. And it says, none of them individually or together measure up. In fact, he goes on to say, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Because there's more things to life than religious heritage and cultural heritage and and resumes. We value our personal ambitions. We value our dreams. We value our family relationships, our friendships, our interests, our hobbies, our, our politics. And again, none of those things are bad. Paul is comparing here. But he says when anything at all either separately or combined, becomes more important to you than knowing Christ as Lord, you're imbalanced. You're imbalanced. And you're on your way to losing the joy, the only joy that's worth anything in life. And we have to make it clear, he says, knowing Jesus, my Lord, it's not knowing about him. It's hard to grow up in America and not know about Jesus. Before Paul became Jesus' disciple, he knew about him made no difference to him. He thought he was a cult weirdo wacko guy and he wished nothing but he was glad that he got crucified. But he knew about him historically. So you can historically know about Jesus. That's not what he's talking about here. What changed Paul was meeting Jesus. The literal living Christ. The Son of God in person. Developing a relationship 
was somebody who's not a historical figure, but a living being. I have a, I have a wonderful wife. I have a great family. I have a beautiful home, good friends, good job, live in a good place. I have certain talents as a writer. I have certain passions and interests and hobbies that bring me pleasure and happiness at times. And I'm sure you have very similar things. But all of those can and will be taken away from you, either in life or in death, every one of them. And when life goes south and pain and trouble shows up with a vengeance, which it can, you're going to find none of those things will bring you the happiness that they used to. They'll all just crumble like dust. That's why Paul writes, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and and he's not done there, and count those things, but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ. Now here's what what he's saying. Paul either lost or gave up all those things, not because he had to in order to be saved, but because all those things had lost their appeal to him. Suddenly and dramatically. He had found what Jesus called himself in the New Testament, the pearl of great price. Jesus described himself, he says, I'm like that pearl that you find and you realize this is so precious, so amazing. It's worth more than everything else I have and I'm willing to sell everything else I have in order to gain this. Paul had found that and it was Jesus. And that was worth more than anything else. By the way, the word that is translated into the Greek as rubbish is inaccurately translated. It is not what it means. I think the translators likely didn't want to translate it literally, so they got across the general meaning. The Greek word skybalon would have made people blush when they heard it. When this letter was written and, and was read to the Philippians, I'm sure when he got to that part and somebody was reading it, a few people giggled. Because literally the word means excrement. Manure. Poop. Poop. That's literally what the word means. So hear what Paul is saying. All the things I used to think were so important and valuable to me in life. The things people admired me for. The things people wanted to be like me for. I consider now nothing but a huge pile of poop compared to knowing Christ my Lord. I mean, (laughs) that's a powerful picture. That's an amazingly powerful picture. One commentator wrote, what his spiritually blinded eyes had seen as a boatload of treasures, the light of Christ had revealed as a pile of manure. And that's why Paul continues, that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. This is basically a two or three line summary of the book of Romans. You go study the entire book of Romans, this is a synthesis of the entire book of Romans. Everything that Paul talks about in Romans is synthesized in these few phrases. Paul had spent his entire life like us trying to be good enough, trying to be moral enough, righteous enough. So when Paul lost everything to identify with Jesus, and he did, what he was startled to find was that losing everything didn't bum him out. It brought him joy. That's the thing that blew Paul's mind. You would think getting rid of all those things would bring you nothing but sadness and regret and loss, but wait, not if you got something better, right? You know, somebody bumps into my CRV and all of a sudden my 2013 CRV is no good and I bummed until somebody drives up with my brand new Range Rover. Okay, I'm over it. I'm good. I'm good. See, that, that's what Paul is talking about. Paul had spent his entire life trying to be moral enough, righteous enough, holy enough to earn God's approval. It was an exhausting and joyless existence. It always is. And it's frustrating because you know you never quite get there. And then when he found Jesus, he realized, wait a minute, I'm being gifted the righteousness I've been trying to earn all my life. 
I think we've all had somebody in our lives who um, we were never quite good enough for. No matter what we did, we just weren't quite good enough for them. They, they communicated to us that we disappointed them, we let them down, we didn't act good enough, we didn't look good enough, we didn't behave good enough, we didn't perform good enough. And so we're tempted to say, you know, <laughs> I'm done with you. Bless your heart. I don't need this anymore. So you go your way and I'll go my way because I really don't want to have anything to do with somebody just raining on my parade and telling me how bad I am day after day after day. I'm out of this relationship. And this is how so many people are with God today. This is where they land. And why do they land there? Well, because he's that great figure in their life that they feel like they could never quite please. No matter how good you are, he's God for crying out loud. No matter how good you are, you're not even close to perfect. We can't even be able to spell the word. He's absolutely perfect. Maybe they went to church and were religious for a time. Maybe they learned all about God's rules and his Ten Commandments, and they realized, oh, man, I can't live up to that. And you know what happens when that occurs and you continue to fail? You feel guilty about it. And then after a while, you begin to associate God with negative feelings of guilt. And you finally say, I'm done with that. I don't want to have a relationship like that in my life. Who needs this? I'm out of this. <laughs> but that's not the gospel. That's not Christianity. Christianity is about God sending Jesus to live the perfect life moral, holy life that you couldn't, that I couldn't. God knew we could not be what he demanded, so he sent his son to be what he demanded for us. Jesus became the perfect person God required on our behalf. He came to do for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. That's the gospel. It's not good news. Hey, try harder. You may make it. Chances are slim. God's perfect. You're not. You may make. That's not good news. Good news is it's been done for you. That's where Paul's joy was planted. Paul realized that he didn't have to have, quote, a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. Now listen. The righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Where does the righteousness come from? From God. How do you get it? By faith. Where does it come from? How do you get it? That's revolutionary. That's the gospel. There's not a religion out there that says that, but Christianity. We're the only ones, because this is God's. And that was the source of Paul's joy. It was a reason he could let go of everything else. He'd been trying to pay God with monopoly money. And God finally showed him that. Our human efforts, your human efforts, are doomed to fail. Jesus wasn't. So to put your confidence in you, and what you can do, it's a loss. And that's what the joy is about. Why did the angels announce to the shepherds in the field on the night of his birth, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which shall be for all the people. What did Jesus tell his disciples in John 15, 11? These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be made full. What did Jesus pray for his disciples to have in John 17, 13? But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. Joy, 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 joy. Over and over again, joy, joy, joy. That's what he came to give us. Jesus came to help you enter into his joy, the joy he's provided for you the acceptance with God that we all want. You know, often for um, gifts, we will give people prepaid gift cards. You know, we'll give them $25 TJ Maxx card or a $50 restaurant card, whatever it is. You know how much that thing's good for? If it's for 50 bucks, it's for $50, not $50 and a penny. It's good for exactly $50. Our own attempts at goodness to gain God's approval are like trying to pay off the multi-trillion dollar U.S. debt with your $10 Starbucks card. That's what it's like. And then something happens. 
what you gained can't be compared to what you lost. It falls infinitely short. That's why Paul says, I want to know him. I want to know the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Many people feel that to become a Christian will be to lose things they love too much. But it's not the end of your happiness, it's the start of your real joy. Giving up trying to earn salvation is like having a $2 scratcher from the lotto. It didn't win anything. That's what you got in your hand. And then somebody comes up and says, you know, I've got the winning $500 million lotto ticket. I'll just give it to you. Are you going to be torn about that decision? He says, I, I, I'll give that $500 million ticket, but you've got to give me your scratcher. You've got to give me that $2 worthless scratcher. Will you, will you make that trade? That's the gospel. That's what Jesus is offering. And we're trying to hang on to the $2 scratcher that didn't win anything and never will. He says, I've got the winning ticket for you. And in this case, what you have gained isn't a thing, it's a relationship knowing him. And Paul talks about the fellowship of his sufferings because there are sufferings. It's not easy to be a Christian. To be a Christian is to swim upstream in a downstream world. Always. Until the very end. But guys, temporary loss, 50, 60, 70 years, eternal life, eternal resurrection, a new kingdom, a new world, a new life, a new heart, a new spirit, a new body, no sin. Oh, the $2 scratcher, you know. And even in the difficult times, Jesus is with us. He says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Even those times when you don't feel his presence, he's there. He's there. You know, at the end of this passage, Paul says, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Now, when you first look at this, it kind of looks like what Paul is saying is, and, and I sure hope at the end I'm resurrected like Jesus promised. But Paul knew that he was going to be resurrected. That's the promise of the gospel. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that's Paul's dissertation on the resurrection. I think Paul is saying something deeper here and something pretty poignant to, to where many of us are at. Paul is basically saying that he wants to be so much like Jesus in the way that he lives his life that he would appear as a resurrected person in the midst of zombies, the walking and living dead. That when they looked at his life, they would see life, the kind of life they don't see walking around with other people. He says, I want, I want, to, I want them to see that I'm alive. And it's not just my physical life. There's something else inside of me that God has put there. Or to put it more colloquially, as I walk your streets, as I walk into your homes, as I walk into your stores, as I walk into your offices, as I mingle among the sons of men, I want to be so living for Christ, so outstanding for him, that you can see that I am a living one among the dead ones. So what Paul is saying here, I think, is that a Christian life properly lived should make us stand out as new people living new lives in an old, broken world. So Paul exchanged his moral resume, his ethnic pedigree for Christ's righteousness and found out he was way ahead. Profit and loss. Have you done that? Have you done that? There's a missionary, Jim Elliott, who said he is no fool who gives up but he cannot keep in order to gain that which he cannot lose. And that's what Paul's saying here. It's probably where Jim Elliot got it. True, lasting, and impenetrable joy awaits the person who's willing to make this trade. Your goodness for Jesus' goodness. Your resume for Jesus' resume. Your efforts for Jesus' efforts. And you get this by faith. You accept this by faith. You just believe it. That's your work. That's your only work. Just believe. And it's not easy. It's going against the grain of what everybody else is saying and thinking and doing. But resurrection, eternal life, 
perfect peace, eternal forgiveness, impenetrable joy are worth anything you will lose on this earth. Anything you will lose in this life. Guys, the only way to win at the confidence game is to put your confidence in Christ alone. Alone. Will you do that? Guys, that's, that's the path to peace if you're a Christian. And if you're not a Christian, that's the path to life. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, how we praise you for what you have done. How we praise you for who you are. Lord, thank you. Jesus, Lord, thank you. That you did it all. You were the, the perfect example that the Father required and we could never be. You're the second Adam, the one who fixes what was broken the first time around. Lord, thank you that the gospel is good news. That, Father, when we put our faith in what you have done for us, you gift us your righteousness. You gift us life, newness of life. You cause us to be born again into your kingdom, into your family. And, Lord, we thank you. Lord, help us to walk out of here knowing that we will never be the perfect people we want to be, but that you were for us. But that your heart has begun to change our heart, your presence in our lives has begun to change our hearts so that we become more holy, we become more righteous, even in the midst of our failures. Lord, I pray, help us as Christians to, to cling to this truth with everything we've got, to never let it go. And Lord, I pray if there's anyone here who does not know you, who has never yet done this, that this morning, at this point, they would do that. They would simply give their life to you. In a moment, I'm going to make, I'm going to say a prayer out loud. And if you're here and you want to receive Christ as your Savior, um, as I say that prayer out loud, I'm going to encourage you to, to pray that same thing in your heart, in your mind. God knows what you're thinking. These won't be special words or special uh, phrases that there aren't any it's just sharing your heart with god a prayer as simple as this dear lord i see now that i can never be good enough to earn my way to heaven but i see now that you sent jesus to do that in my place. And then on the cross, Jesus paid for my sins. So this morning, I ask you to forgive me. And I ask you to come into my heart and to make me brand new. Make me one of your children, Lord. And if you prayed that prayer this morning and you meant it, God meant it. Don't worry about whether or not you're feeling special things or not feeling special things. It doesn't matter. God says, whoever comes to me, I will not turn away. And if you prayed that prayer this morning and you meant it, uh, just a celebration just went off in heaven because somebody who was lost has been found. There's so much more for you to learn and please come and share with us your decision. If you made a decision for Christ, we can help you grow. Lord, this morning we just pray. As we leave this place, may these truths resonate. May they echo in our hearts and our minds. Reorient the way we think to the gospel. And then help us to live as people who have truly been born again. And all God's people said, amen.